AD is this segment perpendicular to DC. What's that tell me about that angle right there? It's a little box right there. Now we could go through and say, then if this is a right angle, what do we know about it? It's 90 degrees. We don't need to do that because we had a theorem that we wrote down here not too long ago that said, what's true about this right angle and that right angle? They're congruent. All right angles are congruent. So we don't have to say that they're 90 anymore. We did a week or two ago, or when we first started these, we had to say that they were 90, then say that they were congruent because they had the same measures. We have a theorem now that takes away a couple of those steps. So we should be able to say that those two angles are congruent to each other. What's our first column called? Statements. Reasons. What's our first statement going to be? Uh, say it again. Who is that keeps throwing that congruent word in there in the wrong spot? How did we know that? Now, where most of you are having trouble when you've got to come up with reasons on your own. That's where everybody has trouble at. So if you're watching right now, I'm going to try to explain to you how sometimes you can figure this out. What's the key idea in that first statement that we made? One word. Give me one word. Perpendicular. Perpendicular. Right? Guess what our number two reason down here is going to start with? Perpendicular. Perpendicular. We're saying if we know this, then we know something else. All right? What did that perpendicular tell us? What these, when these two are perpendicular, what did that tell us? So what angle is a right angle? One letter. We can use one letter this time. Let's be lazy. Angle B is a right angle. Angle B is a right angle. What's the key idea in statement one again? What's the key idea in statement two? Right. Right angle. This over here is going to say something like this. And we could write it out this way. I try to shorten things up as much as I possibly can. But we could write it as an if and then statement. If perpendicular, then what happens? Right angle. I think I told you to write it perpendicular lines form right angles. Just to make it make a little more sense. But that's the way it works. You're saying, OK, I knew this in one. What can I say from that? Why can I say that? Because perpendicular lines tell us that we have right angles. Perpendiculars right there, right angle right there. The if part, the then part. What are we going to say next? AD is perpendicular to DC. Now somebody said we could say angle B is, it equals 90 degrees. Measure of angle B equals 90 degrees. Could we have went there? Yeah. 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 If we were going to do that, it's going to make our proof two or three steps longer because that means we're not going to use that theorem that you guys told me earlier where what do we know about two right angles? They're congruent. We don't have to say that it's 90 degrees because it's just going to make everything longer. Could we? <laughs> yeah, this would be about, uh, let's see, it would probably be seven steps instead of five. So we would have two extra steps in here. Wouldn't, doesn't matter, it's still going to give you the same answer. But it's just a longer way to do it. How did we know that? Yeah. Looking at your pattern here. We said these two are perpendicular, then we said something about a right angle. These two are perpendicular, what do you think we're going to say next? Something about a right angle. Which angle? Angle D is a right angle. Abbreviate stuff. RT. What's RT stand for? Right angle. Make sure you're using your symbol in front of the D. 
How'd you know that? All right. And I'm going to write it a different way this time. Still means the same thing. Perpendicular lines form right angles. Just because that's the way I'm used to writing it. You can do it either way. Perpendicular lines form right angles if you should, this up here probably should say, if lines are perpendicular, then you have right angles to make it make more gra grammatical sense. Got this right here is a right angle. I got that's a right angle. What can you tell me about? They're congruent. They're congruent. So angle what? Had a lot of people doing this. A lot of people writing it out going, angle B is congruent to angle D. You don't have to do that. When you were doing x last year, did you do this? x is equal to 5. No. no. You don't need that word is in there. The congruent takes care of it. How did you know uh, angle B was congruent to angle D? All right angles are congruent. Second shortest theorem that we're going to have this year. Second shortest theorem we're going to have this year. All right angles are congruent. Anybody have, remember what the shortest one is? Deals with this. Deals with these two angles right there. Vertical angles are congruent. Get this down. Get it, Dawson? Yeah. Next one. First thing we're going to do on this next one. I sort of like these when they give you a picture because it gives you some real life setup where you're going to do this stuff at. And then I sort of don't like them because as soon as somebody sees that real life setup, what's that do to Jacob up here? He's up here going like this. Looking in the mirror and stuff, trying to straighten his hair and he's not focused anymore. So you might want to do this anytime you have a real life picture, just do something like this. Draw in the lines that they actually have there and just look at that and try to ignore the other stuff. What's the first piece of given information tell us? Angle one is congruent to angle four. So I'm going to mark those. Angle one is congruent to angle four. Mark them with the same kind of arcs, however you're going to do it on your picture there. That tells us that those two are congruent. What's the next piece of given information tell us? That's it. That's, it. Uh, that's not good. Because if we only got one piece of given information, that means we got to come up with stuff from where? Head. Your head, the picture. You got to use your brain a little bit. Tell me something that we know. Angle one and angle two are vertical angles, so they have to be. So if I marked angle one with one arc, what am I going to mark angle two with? One arc. Two and three. Three and four are congruent. Now, before we go to that, what's that tell us if all three of these are marked with one arc? They're all congruent. What are we trying to prove? Angle two and angle four are congruent. Do we know angle two and angle four are congruent? Do we want to throw in angle three then? No. We don't need it, do we? 
That's a lot of times there'll be information you don't need. All right? So we don't even want to go to the fact that angle three and angle four are what to each other? Congruent because they're vertical. We don't need that. Let's not put it in there because it's just going to confuse things, make everything longer. What's our first column? You can shorten it up, put S and R if you want. That's fine. <clears throat> What's our first statement going to be? How did we know that? Given. Given. Make sure. I'm going to start taking off points. Got to number your statements and reasons so I know what matches up to what. That was all the given information, so we came up with something on our own. What did we come up with? How do I write that? What are we going to say about those two? They're congruent to each other. Angle one is congruent to angle two. How did we know that they were congruent? Vertical angles. Don't just write vertical angles. That didn't tell me anything. A month ago, you didn't know what vertical angles were. Now you know vertical angles are congruent. You gotta write that out completely. Vertical angles are congruent. Do you need the R there? I probably wouldn't take off points for that, but Peyton, if, if you're getting that lazy where you won't write the word R, then we need to have a little chat. <laughs> so vertical angles are congruent. Look at what we have in number one here. We got two angle ones. Angle one, angle one. If angle one's congruent to that, they're the same as that one. Angle one, same as that one. What can you tell me about those two? They're congruent. So they're, they're the same or congruent. Angle two is congruent to angle four. And that's substitution. Substitution property. Very good. Is that, would that be substitution property of equality? You don't have to put of equality. It is. But you really don't have to put of equality because the of equality part is when you're doing something to both sides of an equal sign. And we're not really doing something to both sides. We're just here, we're just taking out, we're taking out the one down, or let's say the one up here, we're taking it out and we're putting the two in its place. So we're not doing something to both sides. Whenever you use that of equality, that's more for when we're doing something to both sides of an equal sign. Say if I put that on the test, would you take off for it? Put it right there. No. Now, I will take off point if we were doing subtraction property of equality, and you left that off and just put subtraction property. Because subtraction property is doing this 5 minus 3. Right? But with substitution, it really doesn't matter. So if you put that of equality on there, probably a safe bet. What's our next statement going to be? We're done. That's it. How many points was this worth on the test? Six. Six points. One for each. Yep. Next one. Confuse some people with this because it said solve. You do have to solve it, but the directions above said write a two column proof. Sorry that I confused you. No, you don't get any extra points because I confused you. On this one, I'm actually just going to go ahead and start with the two column proof. Notice when I've done those first two, did I draw the two column right away? No. What did I do? I figured everything out in my head so I know what I'm going to do. With this, it's just solving an algebraic equation so it's a little different. But on the geometrical ones, think everything through before you start to write a two column proof. Ginger's going to, later on in the year when we're doing two column proofs more, she's going to have her raise her hand and I'm going to walk over to her. She's going, I don't understand this two column proof. I'm going to look at the picture that's with the proof and I'm going to look at her paper and she's going to have the two columns drawn and have the given written in there and nothing on the picture. And I'm going to say, sorry, Ginger, I'm not going to help you. Because you've got to think things through before you start to try to write the two column proof. Just like you should... I know it doesn't happen all the time, but if you're in English class and you have to write a paper, you should do what before you start to write your final draft? 
do a rough draft, do an outline, do whatever, something, right? And I'm sure the teacher tells you that all the time, and still there's people who, oh crap, I got a three-page paper due tomorrow, and they start writing it nine o'clock the night before, all right? Same idea here, you gotta think things through before you start to do this. On this one though, with the algebra problem, what's our first statement gonna be? You're just gonna write that down. I had some people that were so lazy, didn't write it down. Also drew an arrow like that. Yeah, that was minus one. Some of them didn't even bother to write it down at all. Didn't bother to draw an arrow. That. Right. That's not that much. What goes here? Yeah, me. Yeah, I got confused on this question, so I just solved the actual question itself. I can figure out what F was. Goes back to our thing with Peyton and ARE. We can't be that lazy, right? You know, I wrote this out, but then I started to solve it, and then I was like, I tried to, well, I tried to solve it first so I could do the two the truth, but then I don't know, there were negatives, and then I couldn't figure out what X was. You could figure it out. So, so what Peyton's sort of saying is, on these algebra ones, might it help to solve it first so you know the direction you're going in? Maybe that would be the thinking it through beforehand, before you start to write your two columns. What is the first thing that I do here? Uh, distributive property. And you might even write that down over here before. Distributive property. Ethan's going to ask it, right? Ethan's going to ask, is that distributive property of equality? Yeah, it is. Are we doing something to both sides of the equal sign? Yes. No, so I don't really care about putting the of equality on there. What do we get when we distribute? Equals what? Negative 12. Most common mistake on this one? That plus or minus right there. A lot of people put minus because they forgot a negative times a negative gives you a positive. So that messed up your equation all the way down through here. What do I do next? <laughs> Subtract 36 on both sides. What's that leave me with on the left? 12x equals negative 48. What did I use there? Had a couple people who wrote that down. What's wrong with that? I don't know if it's substitution or subtraction. Subtraction property. Again, if it's just that, I'm going to mark it wrong from here on out. Might have got lucky this time. I might have wrote the of equality on the end for you and gave you the point. Now what do we do? What's your question? You could just do the equals. Yeah, like that. Divide by 12, what do you end up with? X equals negative 4. What did we use there? Division property of equality. Do we need to go any farther? No, we just wanted to solve for x, and that was it. How many points would that have been worth? Eight, eight points. Make sure your names are on those. Here in a second, you're going to pass them to your left. Once they get over here. This row is going to pass them back to the lovely and talented Miss DeBoo. She's going to show us her paper holding skills when she gets all of them. If she doesn't hold them, then Peyton doesn't have much faith in you. Showing concern that your paper holding skills isn't very good. The other paper that was going around. The other paper that was going around, anybody claim it? 
No, I didn't even get a list one. Oh, Peyton was trying to hoard it. To see work off the test. Before I answer any of those, first thing I'm going to tell you is the test was worth 58 points. I will not explain to you how to figure up your grade. You know how many you missed? The total on the test is 58. So it's worth 58 total points. If you know how to figure out your grade, or if somebody in the room knows how to figure it out, I will be quiet for about 30 seconds. You can explain it to everybody else in the room, but I refuse to explain how to figure up a grade to a high school student, because that's something you should have learned a long, long time ago. So somebody figure out, tell everybody else how to do it. They just take the Go ahead. Don't ask me, just tell everybody. Uh, isn't it questions divided by how many you missed? No, no. how many you missed? You subtract no, you how many you missed from 58, and then you take that number and divide it by there 58. There you go. Explain one more time, because I see blank yeah, looks on people's said, faces. Said it really fast. Oh. You take that number, subtract it by how many you missed, and then you take that number and divide it by 58. And then you move the next one back over to you. Say it one more time because I still see the cookie. Jacob, you can say it. I don't want to say it. Oof. I'll say it one time, but I will not say it for the rest of the year. Huh? Sorry. Do what? Sorry, you, you just said I refuse to say it. Now you're saying it. You want me not to say it? I mean, you said you weren't going to. All right. Just go back and forth. All right. Questions, problems you want to see work? None, everybody understands it all? Well, I mean, I hope it's only, I hope it's only, can you get number 22? Find this problem on your paper. It's one that deals with converse, inverse, and contrapositive. You should notice by now, I do not give these numbers when I'm working them out up here on the board. Because, anybody have a reason why? Exactly. Say it louder for him, Dalton. Because they're different on everybody's tests. So it's different tests. Do not tell me numbers. Not number 58 either. That was the points on the test. That's our original statement. What's this again? What's that part called? Hypothesis, good. What's this called? Conclusion. Converse. What's the converse due to the original statement? Flips the hypothesis and the conclusion. So what's it going to say? And it should make ma or grammatical sense, so you should put the two angles in the first part. If two angles congruent, then, and I would let you shorten it up quite a bit. I didn't take off points for not having every word in there or anything. If two angles are congruent, then what do we know? They are what? They're vertical. So if we got two congruent angles, does that mean they have to be vertical angles? So is that true or false? It's false. Oops. Inverse. What's the inverse do to the original statement? What's the inverse do? The gates both halves. So what's it going to say? Two angles are not vertical. Then they are not congruent. So if two angles not vertical, then not congruent. I would have accepted that. So you got these two angles. They're not vertical angles. Does that tell you that they're not congruent to each other? Is that true or false? That is false. That's false also. Contrapositive. What's contrapositive do? Alyssa, you alright over there? 
flips a man, negates him. So what's it going to say? Two angles are not congruent. Two angles not congruent. Then not vertical. True or false? True. That one's true. Put too many bars on my congruent symbol there. Next question. This one. They tell us this. Find the one that says this. Ray AB divides angle CAD into two angles. Now, they're doing here what a lot of students think. As soon as I say that some ray divides an angle, a lot of students think that what's happening to that angle? Being what? Cut in half. Did they say that? No, no you're assuming stuff, and you can't, be, you can't go through geometry and assume a bunch of things. So if we draw this, angle CAD. Maybe angle CAD looks something like that. Now, do I know that's what angle CAD looks like? They didn't tell us what it looked like. I just drew something to try to use here. All right? It says ray AB divides it into two angles. Maybe AB runs like right there. Maybe it splits it up evenly, but they didn't tell us that. So I'm going to draw it like right there. Now, what's the... Uh, they, they said, show a counterexample to the fact that it bisects the angle. So what could we use that fits this, but shows that it doesn't, or that angle's not being bisected? What was the first one? What did the first uh, choice say? 20 and then 20. So this angle's 20? And then angle C A B is 40. 40? Yeah. CAD? Yeah. So that whole angle is 40. Is that going to work? Yeah. No. If that's 20, this whole thing's 40, what's this? 20. 20. So is it being bisected? Yeah. So that one won't work. All right. What's the next one say? Because we're looking for a counterexample. We're looking for an example that shows it's not always true. Not one that shows it's true. What's the next thing say? So if this angle's 20, this angle's 70, does that ray bisect the angle? No. no. So what is that? True. That's true. That's the counterexample. That's the one we're looking for. So we're looking for the one that says one angle's 20, the other angle's 70. That shows us that not always will that ray bisect that angle. Not from this information. If they would have said instead of A B, ray A B divides angle C A D. If they would have said that it bisects angle CAD, then we would have known for sure that these two angles had to be congruent to each other. Set the test off to the side. Don't do that. Just going through this real quickly. Last year, we're going to do this this chapter, but we're going to, I'm not going to go through this as much as I normally go through it. I'm hoping that you understand it from last year. If I wanted to write an equation for this line, what two things do I need to know? Slope and the y-intercept. So you need the m and the b, right? Everybody remembers that from last year. How do we find the b? That's the easiest one. Where it crosses the y-axis. So it looks like right there. Give me that number. One. How do we find the slope? Somebody said it. Rise over run. Alyssa, I'm about tired of that thing for the day. So rise over run. How do we find rise over run? Find two points and just see how they go, right? How much rise do we have there? Three. Three. How much run? Be careful. Negative four. Negative four. You've got to remember the negative. So our slope would be three over 
negative 4. What would our equation of that line be? Remember, the form is y equals mx plus b. Mx plus b. All right, could we do the same thing, write an equation for that one? Yeah. yeah. What's different about this line? It's a straight line. All lines are straight. It's a horizontal line, thank you, Lauren. It's a horizontal line. In a horizontal line, be careful, what's the y-intercept? Negative two. What's the slope? Zero. Zero. Is that the same as what a lot of you were just saying? No. There is a slope. There is a slope. It's zero. Saying there is no slope, that's something completely different, right? What would my equation for that line be? Y equals zero minus two. So it's just y equals what? Negative. Just negative two. That's for a horizontal line. What if I drew in this line? X. It's going to end up being x equals some number. All right, that's, let's get, come back to that here in a second. What's the slope of that line? Zero. You guys said it earlier for the other one. There is no slope. It doesn't have a slope. All right? Because the slope of this one is zero. So if I got this line right here, Ginger, look. What slope am I walking up? None. Don't say none. Zero. zero. I'm but walking up a slope of zero. Yeah, this was confused. Then, if, then if I was walking up this, you see this? This is a vertical line, right? Now watch, up. I'm going to walk up it. You can't. It's impossible, right? Slope's impossible upon that. <laughs> no slope, or I'm sorry, now you got me saying it. Slope of zero. No slope. Two different things. What's the y-intercept on this one? There is none. Doesn't, it doesn't cross the y-axis. Doesn't have a slope, doesn't have a y-intercept. Can we write the equation that way? No. So what you have to remember is just that your equation is just x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4. It's just some equation like that for vertical lines. Real quickly, uh, get out your notes and write this down. Or just get out a piece of paper that you're going to put your notes on. You can title this. Lines and angles. Or let's, let's even put another word. Pairs of lines and angles. Pairs of lines and angles. You might want to also write this at the top of your notes. New nine weeks, so you might want to write second nine or something like that, so you know where your second nine weeks binder starts at. On your binders, if you have questions on them, make sure you ask me. If you're not sure what you did wrong, make sure you ask. That way, second nine weeks, does it have to happen again? No. Should, binders are supposed to be an easy grade. Not easy, Jacob. Nope. It's not time consuming. It's not time consuming if you do this. Look, I look at Ginger over here. She's got blank paper right in there already in this binder. How time consuming is that? It's already there, isn't it? Doesn't take any time. She's going to write down all of her notes right here in this binder. At the end of nine weeks, what's she going to be able to do? Here, Mr. Eversol. Can we take out this? No, just leave everything in there. Not time consuming unless you do what Jacob wants to do because he knows better than all the rest of us. Write it down on this, stick it somewhere, then ha have to find it at the end of nine weeks to try to stick everything in his binder the correct way. If you do it that way, you make it hard. Do it the way Ginger's doing it over there, easiest grade you're ever going to get. Shouldn't say that because days ago I gave you a quiz where you had the answers to it right on the next slide. <laughs> that should have been the easiest grade. Write down this first one. We're going to write an equation for this line. We're going to write it in y equals mx plus b form. What two things do we need to know? 
M and the B, right? Slope and the Y intercept. We already know the slope, so we got that taken care of. Anybody have any idea how we can find that B? We could do what with it? We could draw a graph. We don't want to do that. It's too I don't like graphing. It takes too long. Easier way. You take that equation, y equals mx plus b, and you fill in the numbers that you know. That 6 right there is a what? x. The 1 is a y. That's your m. So what am I going to put in place of this y right here? What am I going to put in place of that m? 3, negative 3. Place that x. How many variables do I have? Should be something I should be able to solve, right? So I end up with one. What's negative three times six? How do I solve for b? Add 18 on both sides. Very good. These cancel out. You're left with b equals what? So I now know b is 19. M is negative three. What's my equation for that line? Y equals negative three. Extremely easy. Are there other ways you could have found B? Yes. Yeah, you could have graphed. I probably wouldn't want to graph on this one because if it crosses the y-axis at 19, it's probably going to go off your graph, isn't it? Because usually our graphs aren't that big. Could have also used point slope form instead of y equals mx plus b and wrote an equation for it. Abigail is rolling her eyes at that form because they're probably talking about that here. They already did it in, in algebra two, and a lot of people don't like point slope form. Sometimes you got to deal with fractions in it, and that makes it so it's not much fun sometimes. Next thing, I want you to write down this one. Write down this one on your paper. Write it like this. Write one of them there, one of them there, because we're going to work them straight down below each one, if that makes sense. Still with us, Dawson? Apparently not. What's the name of Stand up, stretch it out or something, Dawson, so you can stay stay woke up. Yeah, that one wake me up. My mom splashed me with water. Yeah, I'll even open up the door for you. For the past week, it's been. Like there was AC in here, and now today all of a sudden it's 110 degrees. I don't like it the other day when everybody else was going to in here. I'm sorry, it's true. I like it. Yeah, it's On this, systems of equations, systems of equations. You learn three different ways to solve systems of equations. Abigail's probably lucky because she's got a program on her calculator that just lets her do these systems of equations without having to actually solve them. She wanted to be nice, she could probably share it with all of you that has a TI-83 or 84 calculator and that would be fine with me, that doesn't break my heart at all. So. You learned three different ways last year to solve them. One of those ways was substitution. Most people don't like substitution, so we're not going to talk about that a whole lot. Second way was graphing. When we graph these two, each one's a line. Where's the solution at? Where the inter where they intersect? All right, we have an x and a y. Wasn't there like you have to like times it by a certain number? The third way is elimination. That's the one that we're going to do. Elimination is also, or you'll hear me call it, the multiplication addition method. Multiplication addition method. Guess why I call it that? Because you multiply and add. You multiply then add. You multiply then add. Focus, Alyssa. 
So we want to pick a variable in these two equations, either the x's or the y's, and we want them to be opposites of each other. I'd say x's. So Dawson says the x's. What do I got to do to this x to get it to be opposite of that x? Multiply by a negative 2. This is what you should be writing down there on your paper. You're going to multiply that whole equation by negative 2. What's negative 2 times x? Negative 2. So I'm going to write that right down below here. What's negative 2 times 2y? Negative 4y. What's negative 2 times 2? Negative 4. That was the multiplication part. Now we have the addition part. We're just going to add the columns. What's 2x and a negative 2x give you? They cancel out. It gives you nothing there, right? What's a negative y and a negative 4y give you? Negative 5y. What's 4 and negative 4 give us? Zero. zero. We need the zero over there, right, to hold the side of the balance. What's nice about this new equation? How come when I look at it, I have a smile on my face? It's real simple. What I, not two variables in it. What I do to solve it? Divide by negative 5. What's y equal? That's part of our answer. We can go back to any of these three equations. It doesn't matter which one. I'm going to pick this top one right here. I got x plus 2. In place of y, what are we going to substitute in? 0. Equals 2. What is 2 times 0? Zero, so we got x plus zero equals two. two. Do we really need that zero there? No. Doesn't do anything. Let's get rid of it. So what's x equal? Now again, we said we could have graphed this, and what we just found was the point where they intersect. So when you get your answer, the best way to write it might be as a point. What would those two answers be as a point? Two zero. Two, zero. That's telling me where, on a graph, where those two lines intersect at. Next one, pick me a variable in the next one, x or y? Thought I, what, say it again? Y. Thought I heard somebody say y, but doesn't really matter. What do I got to do to this y to get it to be opposite of that y? Multiply by negative 2. Look, I'm going to put the negative 2 on this end. Does it matter? I do it, but just because that other number is in my way. What's negative 2 times that x? Negative 2x. What's negative 2 times that 2y? Negative 4y. What's negative 2 times that 2? Negative 4. That's the multiplication part. We add them straight down. What happens with the x's? Everything cancels, Everything cancels out. So what do I end up with? 0 equals when that comes out to be a true statement, does 0 equal 0? Yeah. yeah. If it was 13 equal 13, it'd be the same way. All right? If it comes out to be a true statement, see if I remember what's that tell you about our two lines? They're the exact same line. Algebraically, what it tells us is that any number will work is our answer. Last year you probably just said any number. Now we're going to talk about lines, so we're saying, hey, these two lines are the exact same line. What would have happened if it would have came out this way? Zero equals negative three. That's no solution. That's what you would have wrote last year in algebra. There is no solution. What's that telling you about our two lines? They don't intersect. So what are they? They're parallel to each other. So if you come out with something like this, that tells you that you have parallel lines. Guess what we're going to talk about today? Parallel, parallel lines. So if it comes out something like that, parallel lines, something like this, then the lines lay exactly on top of each other. Something like this, how many places are these two lines going to intersect ever? One. Only at one. No more than one. We already got this title, Pairs of Lines and Angles. I'm going to skip over that page. Write those three down.
Three different ways two lines could be related. This started your second nine weeks notes. First notes for the second nine weeks. So Jason, after today, Jason's notebook is going to be what percentage? I hope 100. Who said a zero? Peyton, you got no trust in anybody today, do you? I was thinking of the opposite. Uh, I was thinking of the opposite. Nah. It was two, Jason. He was trying to be a he, he was trying to be a knucklehead for it. No, no, I think I'm not doing one word. Uh, no, I just forgot the order. I got my zero to one hundred. <laughs> First one, parallel lines. Key idea with parallel lines. This is what you learned in the past. Lines that never intersect. That's wrong. We learned earlier this year. Those lines have to be what? Coplanar. What's coplanar mean again? On the same plane. They've got to be on the same plane. So they have to be coplanar. So when I'm looking at this metal line right here, give me another line that's parallel to it. Right? Are they on the same plane? Yes. Yes. Could be. So if I look at this right here, and then I look at this line right here that runs underneath Molly, are those two lines parallel to each other? Yeah, because is there some plane that we could imagine, like Ginger saying, that would run that way? Perpendicular lines. So as you hear perpendicular lines, what do you think of? Right angles. Perpendicular lines look like this. If I go back to my metal line right here, name me another line in the, our room that's perpendicular to that one. The one that way. The one on the board that way. Is the one on the floor this way? Is it perpendicular to that? Yeah. Be careful. Because are they ever going to intersect? Those lines are, those uh, lines aren't coplanar to each other. So that jumps us down to here. Those are non-coplanar lines. So if I'm looking at this line right here that I'm walking across. So this line right here. And I look at this metal line that we looked at before. Are those two lines ever going to touch each other? No, but are they parallel to each other? No, they're skew lines. Well, they're what's called skew lines because they look like this. All right? Well, what's wrong with them? They're, they're never going to touch, but they're non coplanar They're not in the same plane. Do you think we're going to deal with skew lines a lot? No, because when they try to show you skew lines in the book, it's going to be hard to do, isn't it? Because when they draw them in the book, what's it going to look like? It's going to look yeah, like they're it's touching it's every time. Like a 3D. All right, it's got it's have to be three dimensional somehow. But like, how? Do, what are those skew squares in the math? Skew lines? Yeah. Not really a whole lot. Because we can't really make up rules about skew lines because they don't touch and they're not parallel to each other. So if I'm looking at this. That's my picture. Name me a line that's parallel to line AG right there. HE. HE. That's a pretty easy one, right? Name me a line that's perpendicular to line AG. AH, even though I didn't put the right angle symbol in there like I should have to let you know it was perpendicular. All right? Name me a line that's skewed to AG. VF. Is that going to work? No, because what would those two be? Parallel. Parallel. How about BC? Is that going to work? Yeah, BC is like going to go behind this one, isn't it? Now, what if there's like a line here and it's like technically perpendicular, but it's like down lower? Then it, if it doesn't touch it, it can't be perpendicular. Perpendicular. Per like parallel. Like if there's one like So if there's like this? Is there some plane that would contain both those? Yeah, it's going right up through here. So if they're parallel, that means they already are coplanar. Right, they're 
or some point. All right, write this down through a uh, point not on a line. So we have this point. It's not on this line. There's exactly how many lines that go through that point that's going to be parallel to this line in our world. One. There's only one. When I draw this, when I drew that line right there, that blue one, there is no other line in our world that would have par been parallel to that red one going through that point. So no matter what, that's the only line that's parallel. What that allows us to do, if I give you some line and you're standing on this point right here, and Jaden is walking down this line, and you're getting ready to walk up here, and you want to be parallel to Jaden, how many different paths are there in our world that you could walk to be parallel to Jaden? One. Only one. So that path has to be somewhere right there, if I could draw the line correctly. There's only one line that's parallel to that one. What that allows us to do is draw lines through points not on a line and then conclude, hey, this one is parallel to that one. Now, the other thing I want you to draw in this picture, these arrows, those arrows are the symbols to tell you parallel. So if you see those extra arrows on lines in a picture, that means that those lines are parallel to each other. So if I draw these two lines, are those two lines parallel to each other? We don't know. We don't know. Now I do this. Are they parallel to each other? Sure. Yes. All right? Because that symbol tells us that. It's just like the right angle symbol tells you that you have a right angle. The little box tells you you have a right angle. So those extra arrows. Some books will just draw an arrow like this. Some will color them in. Don't get them confused with the arrows on the ends of the lines. <laughs> Two completely different things. Sometimes they'll put double arrows on them like that. Because you might have other lines in the picture and they, this is telling you that those two are parallel, these two are parallel. Write that one down. It flipped on me and I didn't mean to flip it. I know it looks the same as the last one, but it's not. What di what's different? <laughs> you did it again. Perpendicular. Perpendicular. And I forgot to say this. Somebody read this to me. Through a point not on a line, there is exactly no line. No, not this. Oh. What I'm getting ready to write up here. What's that say? That means parallel. I forgot to mention that symbol. That's parallel. What's this say? So it's red just like the perpendicular, only one means that they're parallel, one means that they form right angles. So we got this right here. This is Mr. Eversole standing here at point A. Uh, he's standing out in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Because Izzy's such a nice young lady, I'm talking to her on my phone. Izzy's down here, she's on this road, and she's going to get me to the road as quickly as she possibly can because I'm going to die of thirst if I have to walk even two inches farther, even two inches farther than I have to to get to the road, all right? So how is Izzy going to lead me to the road? Straight like that? Yeah. That was straight. What do you mean? Uh, it's going to be what to this line here? Perpendicular. The shortest path, you might want to write this down, shortest path is always perpendicular. Shortest path to anything always forms a right angle to it when it gets to it. So that's the way Izzy wants to lead me to that road to get me there as quickly as possible. Mine was a little off. Just always got to be a right angle right there. How many lines are there that Izzy could have led me through that got me there the shortest way? Only one. There's only one in our world that 
came from my point up here down to this and formed a right angle. All right, only one. That blue line, that's the only line I could have drawn to get me to that red line in the shortest method. Draw this. Draw that picture. We're going to use that picture for about the next five slides. You're going to write a bunch of stuff underneath it. Huh? Yeah, you might want to start it on the next page. Because all the stuff that we're going to do on the next four or five slides is going to go right along with this. So in this picture, I have these two lines. They're coplanar lines. All right? Could be anything. Could look like this, however they look. They're coplanar lines. They're on the same plane. So I have my two coplanar lines. Stay there now. Have my two coplanar lines. Then I have this third line, and it intersects both of them. So it's got to be coplanar with them. It's got to be on the same plane, otherwise it wouldn't intersect both of them. It intersects both of them. This third line is called a what? Transversal. So this is always the transversal. Very important that you know what that line's called. It's called a transversal. When I have two coplanar lines and one transversal, how many angles are formed? Eight. Eight. Tell me something you know about angle one and angle three. They're vertical. They're vertical angles, so they have to be congruent. Tell me something you know about angle one and angle four. They're adjacent. They add up to 180. They're supplementary. They're a linear pair. All those things, right? Name me another linear pair in this picture. Say it again. Angle five and angle seven. Linear pair, right? Name me another pair of vertical angles in this picture. Angle two and angle three. Angle, angle two and angle four. Oh, what'd you say? Vertical. Oh. Right? So we know all that stuff about this picture already. The vertical angles, the supplementary angles, linear. We know all that about this. What we're going to learn from here on out is more stuff. More special pairs of angles here. Like four and five right here. See four and five? They're a special pair of angles, and I call them roommates. How, why do you think I call them roommates? What's in between four and five? Nothing. Nothing. They live in that same room. All right? One and eight, they're a special pair of angles, and we're going to learn what they're called, and they mean something to each other. All right? Four and six, same thing. On this next slide, if I ever get to it, write this down. Special pairs of angles. These are the special pairs of angles that we're going to talk about when you have two coplanar lines and one transversal. And a lot of the students say that you guys have been talking about this in like seventh grade or eighth grade or somewhere down in there with these special pairs of angles when these two lines are parallel to each other. And that's what this is leading us to. The first one, corresponding angles. Corresponding angles. Anybody know what the word corresponding means? together, all right? I got my two coplanar lines. They don't have to be parallel, but if they are, it's still going to come out the same way. Ginger is my transversal. All we're going to do to figure out the corresponding angles is this. Just watch, because they're easy to figure out. Take the two lines, I shove them together. The angles that are corresponding are the angles that lay over top of each other. So if I look up here and I shove this green line down on top of this green line, not fold it, just smash it together. Angle one is going to lay on top of which angle? Angle five. Four is going to lay on top of? Th two on top of? Three on top of? All those pairs that we just named right there are corresponding angles, and that's what I want you to write down. 
One and five are corresponding angles. Two and six are corresponding angles. Three and eight are corresponding angles. Four and seven are corresponding angles. two lines, again, to figure out where the corresponding angles are, smash them together. Just smash them together. And that's the ones that lay over top of each other, going to be the uh, corresponding angles. Next one, next name, alternate interior angles. Alternate interior angles. considered interior angles? Four, three, five, and six. Alternate interior angles are angles that like jump to opposite corners. So five and three, four and six. Those are the alternate interior angles. Four and six, five and three. I'm going to write something else up here for you. This will help you figure out alternate interior angles. Very, very important in geometry. Alternate interior angles do this. If I trace angle 4 and angle 6, what am I forming? A Z. They form a Z or what if it was turned up the other way? It'd be an N. They form a Z or an N. When you trace over them, they form a lightning bolt or a Z or something like that. So you can always tell if, I, if you draw, if you trace the two angles and it looks something like that, hey, those are alternate interior angles. Next pair, alternate exterior angles. Anybody have a guess on the alternate exterior angles? So outside, tell me the pairs. Be careful. Alternate. One and eight, two and seven. Angle 1, angle 8, alternate exterior. Angle 2 and angle 7, alternate exterior. How come not 1 and 2? We already know what's true about 1 and 2. They're supplementary. They're a linear pair. They're add up to 180, however you want to say it. You guys have covered some of this before. Does anybody know the other pair of angles that we're going to talk about? Uh, wait. So, what is the consecutive interior angles and you'll you'll hear me mess up and I'll call them same side interior angles instead of consecutive interior angles consecutive interior angles looking at the interior angles anybody have a guess which pairs are four and five and three and six these are the ones that I said and you might write this down are the roommates in there together, there's no walls between them. Four and five, three and six are consecutive interior angles. They are different than all the other angles. They're not going to work out like Ginger's trying to do with the other angles. They're different. See if I remember with those two. Ginger's trying to say all the, those other ones were congruent. What's true about four and five if the lines are parallel? 
They're not the same. They add up to 180. We already talked about this. You still got vert. You want me to go back? Yeah. You still got vertical angles. You still got supplementary angles. You got all that in there. This is what we need right here. Write this down very, very quickly. These four theorems. These are the shortened forms of the theorems. Let's read the first one real quick before you start to write. What's this say? So if you have parallel lines, then what's true? Corresponding angles have to be congruent. If parallel lines, what has to be true about alternate interior angles? Congruent. If parallel lines, what has to be true about alternate exterior angles? Congruent. If parallel lines, what has to be true about consecutive interior angles? That's the one that's different, isn't it? So make sure, maybe mark that one and write that it's different. Supplementary, not congruent like the others. that picture, what can you tell me about those two lines? What's the arrows tell us? Parallel. Parallel. This line's called the what? Transversal. Transversal. If this angle is 110 degrees, how many of the other angles in that picture can we find? All of them. Every single one. We can find the other set. Tell me one that you know. That's right. Tell me one that you know. Angle six, what is it? 110. Give me another one. Angle three. What do you know about angle three? Same thing, 110. Those were alternate interior angles, right? So they had to be congruent. Give me another one. Angle five, what's it? 70. Those had to be supplementary. Had to add up to 180, so those two. Give me another one. Angle two. 110. It's a corresponding angle with this 110. If you smash them together, they lay on top of each other. They have to be congruent. Give me another one. Four. Angle one, what's it? 70. 70. Give me another one. Four. Give me another one. You can find all those angles. You know, in one measure. We got about two minutes. Same. 12, 18. That was, yeah. yeah. What we're going to do, I'm going to put the assignment up here here in a minute. It's on two separate pages. Not real difficult, most of it. Uh, I think I seen Lila setting an intervention yesterday, and she got it all done and was sitting there screwing around during the intervention the whole time. So it wasn't real hard. That's part of your assignment. The other part of your assignment, as you walk out, you are going to lay your test right here on this stool, and you are going to grab one of these papers off of this pile right here. You're going to redo this for your homework, for part of your homework. Bring this back next time. You're going to turn it in. I'm going to take the points you score off of this and add it to your chapter two test score. If, if, that, if those points would be added to it. So grab this, redo the Two column proofs, there's three of them here. We just did them together. Should everybody sort of have some clue how to do them? If you were paying any attention whatsoever. Make sure you lay your test right here and grab that paper and here's the assignment. As soon as I get to it. Make sure you write down the, oops. Make sure you write down the assignment up there. Page 129, 135. That assignment's not on Moodle yet, so I have to write it down or get it off somehow. Make sure you test. Don't walk out with your test. 
Don't want any zeros. Make sure you grab the worksheet up there. Thank you. 